Hello and welcome to How to Win the Lottery, Episode 5, A Prayer for Owen Meany by John Irving. I'm Joey Lewandowski. I'm Bobby Fisher. And this is our longest book club book yet. So I was, we all season long, we've been preparing people for Ducks Newburyport. And finally, we got two sort of short-ish books and then Ducks. And I'm like, ooh, Ducks is in our very near future. Uh, but this, not an insignificant book in and of itself. Yeah, heavy, both he- uh, um, and, and like content-wise heavy. So I spoiler like this book and we'll talk about the book obviously that's the point of the podcast but i was having a hard time reading it like i think his writing style it was not in a way that i was like because i wanted to hear i was invested in the story but the writing style was giving me pause and i was interesting pushing it off or whatever and then i was like oh no we're recording on monday i need to read a lot of this book (laughs) And so I took advantage of our Audible offer, cageclub.me slash lottery, and I got the two audio books. I got Ducks, because of course, and I got this. And I took a long drive this weekend to visit my friends in Rhode Island. Shout out to Patreon supporter Desiree. Thank you, Desiree. I listened to the book in the car, and I was like, oh, this is kind of how I want to take this book in. I was sort of reassured in a certain way, because after the audio book, there was an interview they did with John Irving, and they talked about his oratory writing style. And it sort of sounded like he was describing, like, it's meant to be read aloud. That's interesting. What I can read quickly is stuff with dialogue. And when there's dialogue in this, it's often like Owen Meany giving a two-page sort of monologue about something. And it's like, it's not really broken up in a way that, like, my brain can, like, take in. Yeah, he has a style that's much more suited to earlier literature. It's, it's you know, he takes his time telling the story. It's, yep. it's very, uh, very, very slowly paced. There are a lot of plates spinning at the same time. Yeah. Thematically, it is, it's also very um, 19th century. It's, it's, it's like, or early 20th century. Well, it, he compared it, he said his, I think his favorite author is Dickens. Does that track, do you think? Or? Well, yeah, I guess. I'm, I, I don't. Dickens is a little bit of a blind spot for me. I've read I've read a couple a couple of them, but not the big ones. You haven't read. Go every- fuck yourself. <laughs> uh, die in. Uh, I will. Uh, <laughs> listeners, there is uh, nothing that I hate more than this happens to me everywhere I go. If someone mentions a book that I haven't read and i say oh I, I haven't read that actually they get all up in my shit about how i haven't read this one book yeah uh and and the reality is that literature is is spanning enough you i could spend every day every second of every day of the rest of my life reading and i i would still never get to uh you know to, uh, tolstoy or something like right. that you, you would still be leaving something on the shelf that someone else thought was the absolute most essential so yeah i um I actually uh you know i wrote my uh undergrad thesis on dickens on hard times social sciences and victorian okay. literature I think maybe I, I walked away from it for that reason. I, I would compare him more to Dostoevsky. Okay. Specifically. And this is the, actually the only Irving that I've read, so I don't know how to how that compares. But Dostoevsky is, um, you know, dealing with, uh, oftentimes dealing with themes of faith, practical matters of faith, and how, how the practice of faith actually lines up with uh, the material conditions of the actual world. Yeah, because so speaking about that, what is this about? Why does that tie into the narrative here? What is Owen meaning about? Yeah. What is it about? That's the real, I mean, that's a really good question that for like I haven't really considered. Well, you could say right like now. there could be like a one word answer or like a one sentence answer or like a three page answer. I mean, I think it's about faith. Yeah. Uh, and and I know that Irving has described it. As, Irving is a non believer, which is a fascinating thing to know when when if you read this book because it does treat faith with such uh reverence yeah such reverence is a good word for it because uh but but the way that irving described it is he thought of it as a problem to solve like okay i'm a non-believer what would it take for me to become a believer and the events of this book are the things that it would take for him to become a believer the, much the way that our narrator johnny is not a non-believer, but he's kind of lukewarm on religion. He doesn't. It's it's not really a factor in his life, right? Well, in the I don't want to say modern day, but in the story he's telling, it's not. But in the modern day in 1987, Toronto, it is because the story is because the novel right. overall is about how Johnny gained his faith. Yeah, through the uh, actions of his childhood best friend Owen Meany. Owen Meany is a boy who 
stopped growing at some point. He's mm-hmm. a, he's a tiny little guy with a uh, all caps voice uh, described as a scream. As a scream, influenced by the fact that perhaps the fact that he uh, grew up in a granite quarry, so he has granite dust in his vocal cords, and maybe has a thing called singer's polyps, which paralyzes the the trachea or something like that. Um, I don't remember the exact details of that. So that's his friend Owen, and um, plot-wise, what's the inciting incident, would you say? So Owen, as the little boy who stopped growing, eventually gets to a point where he's like almost five feet and almost just about 100 pounds, because he eventually joins the military, and like those are the requirements, and he passes those. So he's like, he's not like a two-foot tall guy all his life or whatever, but he's just like this little guy. And by the way, if you're not a Patreon subscriber already, patreon.com slash lotterypod, next week on our off week, we're going to be talking about the movie adaptation Simon Birch, which we have not watched yet, but I'm very curious to see how they depict him in that because... I'm horrified. I'm I'm horrified by the photos. I'm horrified... Have you seen Simon Birch or no? I haven't. Okay, fascinating. Neither, neither have I. I didn't even know it existed. Totally. I'm, I'm horrified by the idea of this being adapted into sure. a movie. Um, but let's let's so, let's yes. get back to it. So the inciting incident is in the first chapter, which is called, I believe, the foul ball. There's only nine chapters, and each of these chapters gets longer and longer. Like the last mm-hmm. two chapters are like over 100 pages each, because mm-hmm. like a 630 page book or whatever. And which I'm sure that there's some kind of like a reasoning for that. Maybe not. Maybe it's just the story that he's telling. I don't know. But in the foul ball, Owen Meany is up to bat at a little league game, and after a series of things that any one of these number of things didn't happen this never would have happened but he gets up to the plate and hits a foul ball into the head of johnny's mother killing her that's how the book basically begins yeah owen doesn't believe in coincidences he's a person of great faith and uh so he believes that that's not that there's a reason um and that he is an instrument of god Mm -hmm. there is a quote that i wish that i underlined so the quote, I believe, is it would take take me years. This is Johnny's narration. It would take me years to learn everything that Owen Meany was thinking, and I didn't understand him very well that night. Now I know that the armadillo, which we'll talk about, told me what Owen was thinking, although Owen himself would not until we were both students at Gravesend Academy. It wasn't until then that I realized Owen had already conveyed his message to me via the armadillo. Here's what Owen Meany and the armadillo said. God has taken your mother. My hands are the instrument. God has taken my hands. I am God's instrument. How could it ever have occurred to me that a fellow 11-year-old was thinking any such thing? Yeah. So it's a book about um, the, the deep belief that Owen Meany is, uh, has purpose, that, that like, God-given purpose, which then we can, we can discuss ideas like determinism and whether or not Owen is actually, if there's actually a plan, if God actually has a plan within the context of this, or if Owen is creating uh, a d- determinism through his through belief so this is again which we mentioned on the thing in, like the last episode is that you said this is one of the four best books of the 80s it might be the best book of the 80s i'm gonna yeah i'm actually gonna uh make an addendum to that i i rereading this it, it i i think this is um one of the forget the 80s like i think this is one of the best english language books ever written so it's very slow as we i think have kind of hinted at alluded to danced around there's a lot that he just sets up that seems to have no payoff for sometimes for hundreds of pages. And yet, I told you I was going to use this phrase, it is to me like the Paddington 2 of books because... So Paddington insulting. Two, no, 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 no. I mean this as the highest, the utmost compliment. Because Paddington 2, people don't believe me when I say it is one of the finest films that's ever been made. And everything in that movie that is set up gets paid off. Even like sort of what seem like throwaway things come back in the end vital and integral to the plot. Right. And so here, I messaged you when I was two or three chapters in, you know, 100, 150 pages in, and that's when I was mentioning, like, this is so well plotted because, like, he'll set up, like, this armadillo and then, like, there'll be this whole back and forth or whatever, and by the end of the chapter, like, four or five things that had been tangentially, seemingly disconnected, whatever, all come together to finish the thought. And it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. And then that's amplified tenfold when, like, things they're doing throughout the novel come into play in the final, like, 15 pages. So what are the novel's mysteries? What are what are the primary concerns? Who is Johnny's father? Yeah, for sure. Is Owen Jesus? Okay, yeah. Kind of. Did Owen actually foresee his death? It's kind of a mystery. Okay. 
he has a dream, a recurring dream, that eventually we find out he sees how he's going to die and when he's going to die and Mm -hmm. is so sure of it that he, because his family owns this granite business and does gravestones, pre-made his gravestone and joined the army to, like, basically make this happen. That's all stuff that we don't really like. Like that stuff; those are the the uh, the various threads in confluence with one another. Sure, right. But our our, our primary mysteries are who's um, Johnny's father? Who's Johnny's father? What is the unspeakable outrage? That's that that's a big one, which is the question about Jesus that, that you're asking. But that's that's seeded in the very beginning as Owen having a specific beef with the Catholic Church. Yeah, and that specific beef with the Catholic Church. Uh, led to his parents leaving the church and him switching from being a Catholic to being an Episcopalian. And he says over and over again, they left the church because of an unspeakable outrage. And because the outrage is unspeakable, he doesn't talk about it. We hear over and over again about this unspeakable a- outrage, but it doesn't. we don't actually learn what it was until after Owen's death. Yeah. Um, at which point we learn that his mother gave a virgin birth supposedly to him well how did, so so i i read that i mean i think you have to take it literally well kind of, but but it also reads like someone who ha- is uh uh processing horrific trauma sure. from, yeah, from yeah, a yeah, terrible yes. assault or something yes. like that like that because she she owen's mother is basically comatose mm-hmm. she stares out the uh, not even out the window she stares at the wall all day long I think they use, and again, this is the 80s, but I think they call her retarded. I think they, they use that. That's a word that, that flows yes. through through. But I mean, like, book. it's that kind of, and that, it's not used, like, pejoratively, like, elementary school kids or whatever, but it's like, she's not well. Yeah, and and um, she barely speaks. When she does speak, the most she speaks in the entire, and she she speaks to tell um, Johnny that, that she's sorry about his mother, right? Yes. She speaks again, very late in the text, basically... As Owen's father is is explaining the virgin birth, yeah, she's just repeatedly telling him to stop, stop, don't tell him that, stop, stop, stop. Because this is the thing: if the claim of the virgin birth were the result of trauma, then that's one thing. But if it is true, then the trauma itself is not the virgin birth. The trauma is the Catholic Church's reaction to the virgin birth, right? Not believing her about this specific thing traumatizes her so much that it sends her into a vegetative state, right? Which, whatever the reality is, which we don't know and we will never know, and almost kind of doesn't matter for Owen and his dad. The trauma is the church, yes, because they they're believers. They yep. they they take it on faith that this is true. And the dad even goes so far when he's explaining, he's like, we've never done it. Yeah. Me, my wife and I have never had sex. Right. Which doesn't mean anything necessarily as as far as her being a virgin is concerned, right? No, right. But he's, yes, because that's it. The, uh, the, the alternative of her being assaulted and raped and whatever, yeah, independent, yeah. totally independent. I would like to hear other people's thoughts on, on, on that. Um, that was my read of it, but also, I mean, it does track within the 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 context of god having a plan for owen that possibly it would be a virgin birth now virgin birth also doesn't mean that he's jesus christ it, it or or the second coming of jesus christ or anything like that it just means um, there's a miracle although in the interview with john irving apparently at one point he had the idea to write owen so owen all of owen's text is in capital letters because it is the scream so it's very mm-hmm. easy to find when he's talking but apparently at one point john irving had the idea to have all of his text in red as well just like Jesus' lines of dialogue in the Bible. I didn't even know that, that was the case with the Bible. What Bible? is Certain Bibles have uh, all right. all, everything Jesus says is in red text. In this interview, in the Audible book, he says he didn't do that because it's a little too on the nose, which, yes. Well, also, it, it, does, it does this thing. I, I don't even like him talking about that because it does this thing where it takes power from the reader. Sure. And it puts, it puts all of that power in the, in the author's hands. And the author, I don't think, should do that. I, I think I think yeah, this was this was a very like overly frank discussion, but for a book that respects its readers yeah. so much in in uh, not laying everything in, in trusting you to follow the path yeah. to then lay out the answer like that so explicitly and him saying that he considered that doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's the it's the truth, because guess what? John Irving doesn't get to decide what the truth is. We do. Sure. Right. It's it's, it's uh, you know, the death of the author. Fuck the author. Fuck he, John Irving. He also said that he didn't do it because I will. Gonna... I, if I see John Irving, it's on site. John Irving. 
he said it would be too expensive for his indie publishers to print a book largely in red, and so he didn't do it that way either. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you, I don't know how often books were published like that. Well, House of Leaves. Apparently the fucking Bible. Yeah, but that's that. You're, that's 13, 14 years after this. Sure. Gimmicky kind of publishing like that. I mean, I love House of Leaves, but that's a gimmick. Oh, right? of course. It's, but that's also, yeah, that also, I mean, the red, the red thing takes the thing that this book already does and makes it very obvious. House of Leaves, the whole thing is the medium is the message, right? Mm-hmm. So different thing altogether. So there's who's Johnny's father? What's the unspeakable outrage? Is there another big mystery or no? Or is it just the two? What makes John convert to Christianity? That's a big one. Yep. What is uh, John's mother's secret life? Where it, it's all kind of the same. The, those things, even even his is his mom's secret life ties into the fatherhood mystery because that the secret life stuff is all red herrings, right? Right. Specifically, red herrings. Wink. Red dress. Gerald's. Should we end the podcast now? Is that too much? <laughs> you might just think that there actually isn't a mystery. Like, his mom didn't have a thing. Like, it might have just been a guy she had a one-night stand Yeah, that doesn't need to be a mystery. And she might have actually just been going to Boston to have a singing lesson once a week. But you find out in reality she's going up there because she's got this standing gig at a local bar because she wants to be discovered, even though she's been told no one's ever going to discover you here. And then that also factors in because that's the one night a week that she can have this ongoing affair with the drum roll, please, minister in town that Owen takes to, but are we led to believe that Owen, so in, we're jumping all over the place and I'm sorry, yeah. but no, it's okay. in this book, Owen gets kicked out of the Gravesend Academy, that Johnny's stepfather, Dan, who by all accounts is his actual father, like he just, not, not birth father, but like, and a great father, and a great father, and a, also, also a great father to Owen. Yes. Owen gets kicked out and they spend a lot of time there and they're in, I think it's Owen and Johnny, and I think maybe even Dan are in the minister Merrill's office, the Reverend Merrill's office at Gravesend Academy, because he's yeah. the he's the school's minister. And he comes in and Owen's like rifling through his drawers, just sort of like absent mindedly. And eventually we find out that the baseball that killed Johnny's mother, Johnny always thought Owen had it, but the Reverend Merrill had it because he was in love with the mom, and because at the time of her death he was so disgusted by his own sin. It's so crazy how many like things have to like it again yeah. the exquisite plotting, but that he was so disgusted with his own sin that he wished she would drop dead, and then Owen kills her. And so the baseball is a sign of his sin and his faith, and God speaking to him or listening to him, I guess. Well, it causes him to lose his faith, too. True, because because he he can't believe that his prayer would be answered because for his prayer to be answered would, would result in him being guilty. So uh, in order to preserve his belief in his uh, inherent morality uh, or, or whatever, he has to lose faith in, in God. So are we led to believe that as Owen is seemingly absentmindedly just opening and closing drawers, waiting for him to come in here, that's when he finds out that yeah, for Reverend sure. Merrill is for Johnny's sure. father. Yeah, and he keeps it quiet because he knows that the Reverend Merrill is is a disappointing answer to that mystery. Where does that fall in relation to them taking a road trip to Boston? That must happen. Oh, uh, you mean chronologically? Yeah, because it must happen after because like Owen wouldn't have gone to Boston if he knew the answer. Because he's not like really because right. at one point Johnny says to him, I think you care more about who my father is than I do. Yeah. So Owen would not have gone to Boston to go to Gerald. Yeah, no, because also after that he follows up on the uh, on uh, you know looking through the phone book for Buster Freebody. Yes, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that, that's that's after the baseball and the drawer shit and, uh, is that's like such serial killer stuff, man. Yeah, like that's real like evidence dungeon, like holding on to the murder weapon. I mean, Merrill didn't ki- uh, Merrill did kill her. M- Merrill killed her as much as Owen did if we if we are to right. track the, the 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 deterministic ideas of these I mean if you believe in determinism then God killed her or or like the universe killed her because sure. there was never any other path but of course when you're even if you're even if you're a believer in determinism when you're the instrument of death like there's obviously some guilt on on sure. you, you feel you feel some guilt and he only restores the faith when again like it's another thing where Johnny's mom is beautiful, mm-hmm. like is described as basically being the most beautiful woman that anybody in this town will ever see. Yeah. And she loves having her all black or all white outfits or like just those two colors and has this like dummy that she dresses up. And the dummy eventually, like it's a stand in for her, for Owen, but then also for the Reverend Merrill to restore his faith. Right. Because Johnny tricks him. And so his mother helped him lose his faith, but also get his faith back. 
you know, dramatic irony, right? The thing mm-hmm. that the thing that makes him re lose his faith is a miracle, and the thing that makes him regain his faith is a fake. It's a, it's fr- a prank. It's, a, it's yeah. a prank. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that's Ir- Irving is kind of playing with this idea of fickleness, right? Fickleness of faith. Like we believe these things because circumstances lead us to believe them, but that doesn't me- make them true or not true, right? That makes them, you know, circumstantial to our lives. Yep. As I was reading this, I was like, I, I realized, aside from just it being well-written and well-constructed and well-paced and everything like that, well-paced if you're into slow things. If you're not into slow things, I don't know how far you're going to get into this book because it's intentionally slow. But it being about belief and also it being so staunchly anti-war, I was like, no wonder, Bob. Yeah. And specifically specifically Vietnam. And then also they yeah. mentioned Gary Hart. And I'm like, ooh, <laughs> yeah. Bob's boy from The Front Runner. Uh, but it's like I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a particular reverence for Gary Hart. No, but you just okay. love the movie The Front Runner. Yeah, it's a good movie. But I was reading it's just like oh th- this combines things in a way that like other things probably don't, and if they do, they don't do it this well. And it's it's not like wildly disparate things, but he weaves these things together in a way that feels. You know how you see a movie and it's like back like hundreds of years ago and like who is this it's like oh this is by michelangelo he might be something someday or whatever just like sure yeah yeah fuck off like come on stop it Mm -hmm. there's i think there's a little bit of that in this where owen just like that's not what they're doing about vietnam like basically for foretelling vietnam but also like the writing was on the wall i think enough smart people at the time were could but it does kind of feel like that at times i think which is like this is not what's happening or whatever so i don't know yeah um and also like in retrospect owen is critical of the anti-war movement in exactly the right ways like owen is th- yes. there's really nothing that owen's wrong about right, right throughout the text which is a little annoying mm-hmm. and i'm sure also annoying to johnny like he probably calls that out but also it makes sense because if he is divine or if he is the chosen one or whatever, then of course, like, if he can see the future, if he can see when he dies, like, why wouldn't he be able to see? <laughs> right, Especially yeah. if he has the dream early enough, mm-hmm. and he believes that the dream is him going and dying in Vietnam, then of course you'd be interested in Vietnam. Yeah, the, the, there's something that was really fascinating um, in in Owen becoming a soldier and wanting to go to Vietnam, because uh, it feels like such a, a stark 90 degree t- turn from from who he is as a person and, and and what his beliefs are when he's having the conversation with johnny he specifically is explaining the dream to him and he says like that he saves children and johnny's like oh and owen's like yeah if i like you think that i would be doing all this to save soldiers no like i i i'm i'm here to save kids i, I don't that's where the heroism comes right. from right and like that's you know, there's like, I think it's the Paul Hardcastle song, 19, like the average age of the Vietnam soldier is 19. And like, then they make a point of it. Like, it's just dumbass kids, largely, getting sent over there. And they have the whole, like, it's a good thing that we're giving them an opportunity. Like, they, they retroactively dissect and analyze the political messaging of the time. Like, we know that we've treated the poor of this country and the underprivileged poorly. And so we're going to give them the opportunity to, like make something of themselves by letting them go to war. And it's like, so you're just like, yeah, killing, join, yeah, yeah. Join, killing dumpy jo- join the meat thresher for a chance at, at enough material gain in America to possibly survive. Yes. Right. Is a, your only way out of utter poverty is to uh, risk life and limb in a morally dubious circumstance for imperialist reasons. And I think the only two soldiers, we only really meet one soldier and it's the major at the end. Mm-hmm. And he's, He's got frustrations. I think he's just like a inadequate. He's incredibly cynical about the war. Yes. But I think also he reflects something in Johnny and something we talked about with the Eggers book about just kind of like the mediocre white man. Like mm-hmm. their life did not unfold the way they wanted it to. Sure. Yeah. And I think he wanted to, like he just hated Because he went over there and he's like, it's better over here. Like why would I want to go back there or whatever? But then the only other, I was going to say soldier, but he's not a soldier, but it's just like, and he's definitely not going to be a soldier by the end of the, because he's dead. But Dick, who... Yeah eventually kills Owen Meany with a grenade, he's like the stereotypical like 16 or whatever, prototypical whatever, 16 or 17 year old in the audio audiobook, like Southern Hick voice. Which is, he's from Phoenix. It's like, right. <laughs> like that's such The a... audiobook is not great. I was I, <laughs> like, come on. I liked having it read to me, but the voice is I don't, I don't know what a Phoenician accent sounds like, right? Is it like? It's probably like this. You think it's southern? It, it's it's no. just like a flat no, I mean like ours, like ours. of middle American. Yeah. Oh, you mean a thick New Jersey accent? I don't think I have an accent. Drop your medial T's like a motherfucker. Come on. 
True. Throw that glottal stop in the middle of regular ass words. Anyway, they have this like seventeen year old. This has like, been a podcast about me criticizing Joey's <laughs> accent. I don't hear it at all. <laughs> You're not listening. But they have him like as this like blood hungry teen boy redneck essentially who just wants to kill Vietnamite. He wants a he wants a license to kill. Well, this is okay. So I th- th- this brings up something that I actually really want to talk about. Good because we've been all over the place. Let's. Uh, well, I I, ha- I have a plan. My my plan was to talk about the you mysteries. Have God's plan. Um, shut up. Uh, <laughs> my plan was to talk about the mysteries, and then uh, n- now let's talk about the villains. Okay. Who are the villains of this book? A lot of people. There's uh, Randy White, the new headmaster. Okay. Why is Randy White a villain? Because he expels, he derails Owen's life. Although doesn't really derail it because he gets Owen exactly where he needs to go. There's no derailing Owen's life. Right. Randy White is a villain because he's an authoritarian. Yes. Right? And because he's a bully and because his bully. Uh, bu- See, that's an accent thing for me. Bully. Bully. He's a bully. Randy White is a bully. First of all, Randy White is not the name of an adult. Well, it's Randolph White, but they call him Randy. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. I, this is a man named Bobby Fisher saying the name Randy White. Is not yeah. An adult. Um, so... He's yeah, we he, got Bobby and Joey over here. He's he's a bully, uh, and he is an authoritarian, and he's a villain because of those things, and because uh, writ large bullies and authoritarians are one of the other one of the other novels villains is Ronald Reagan, yeah. who's an authoritarian and a bully. Yeah. Right there, you have so you have uh, Randy White, you have Ronald Reagan, you have Dick, Dick, um, and I'm going to argue that maybe Dick is not the villain. Dick's a, a, like a, it's a he's a symptom, right? He's fucked up. Yeah, and and I, the reason why I want to walk us away from from Dick being the villain is specifically because of um, a thing in the book that I really affected me emotionally. Uh, like like I felt like my stomach got punched right back into my spine. Uh, there's a part where uh, the major says. Uh, that Dick is beyond saving. And Owen Meany says, it's not up to us to decide who's beyond saving. Right. And that is um, A plus top tier Christianity. Right. That's that's what, like, like, if you were to strip the bones of Christianity, sh- strip Christianity down to its bones and remove all of the, like, cultural, societal influences that have poisoned it for a lot of people. And if and I'm not I'm not a Christian I'm not a I'm not a believer but like I th- there's very few things in my life that I find more beautiful than faith expressed benevolently, as I think Owen is is doing here because what faith does at its best what Christianity does at its best is it provides us an avenue for forgiveness and it provides us a way to look at someone who has been cast off by society regardless of their sins whether they be violent or pick whatever look at them and say you know what maybe it's not up to me and maybe like if we treated that person like a human we could walk them back from the edge now in dick's case it's too late for that because the deterministic wheels have been set in motion but the fact that owen approaches that problem as someone who looks at it and says it's not up to us to to say that that he is he is beyond saving i think is is a thematically powerful version of the novel written in one or two sentences yes yeah. uh, which is like interesting when you compare that to like randy uh randy white because like Randy White's punishment is that, like, they fuck up his car <laughs> and they... No, it's not even his car. Oh, right. It's not even his car. No, he's... he gets trapped inside and gets hurt, but that's not his yeah, car. Yeah, his, his, um, his, uh, his punishment is, is embarrassment. Yeah. Right? His punishment is that he's no longer taken seriously as an authority. Uh, Owen, uh, in, in trying to enact all the powers of his authority, he is stripped of that authority because ultimately Owen is more powerful than he is. Right. Right. So you've got Ronald Reagan, you've got Dick, you've got Randy White, and you've got um Like I think going back to the determinism thing, I think like fate is a villain. I don't know if you want to Oh. Why a villain? Owen's fate, I mean, it's heroic, but it's also like how many people have to die or how many people just die maybe life in general. Because like Owen kills so many people. Not on purpose, but like the path of his life 
Johnny's mom dies. Tabby dies. Right. In a certain way, not a literal way, but he kind of kills Johnny because Johnny is maybe in love with Owen, probably in love with Owen. We'll t- we'll talk about that later. And so whatever it is, Johnny doesn't live a fulfilled life because he's essentially living vicariously to a certain extent through Owen. Everybody else that kind of crosses Owen's path, and maybe it's just like like one of the most effective, I think, cool, <laughs> unsold on that word choice, things that this does is it describes the batters who went before Owen the things they had to do, like one hit like a, a shitty grounder or whatever yeah. that was misplayed in the field. One walked when he shouldn't have walked. Like if either of those guys got out, Tabby would have lived another day. Like this whole novel might not have happened or whatever. But then we're like, oh, yeah, and he got bit. He got snake bit right. in the dick outside of a whorehouse in Vietnam. So he died in Vietnam. And just like that's not Owen's fault, but it's just like it's determinism. It's just almost like knowing the future makes the present even more sad. Like this kid to a certain extent, probably feels guilty, like, oh, if I had just struck out, my friend Johnny's mom would be alive. I mean, that's fatalism, specifically, the idea that the future is determining the past, right? Sure. And then he carries that, essentially, to getting bit by a snake in Vietnam and dying, or the other one getting so fucked up on drugs and alcohol because he doesn't want to go to Vietnam that he becomes a junkie or an addict or whatever and then crashes his car and dies from that. Here's why I think that fate is not a villain. I think you are taking uh, the short view on death and ascribing moral qualities to death and life, which is um, if we take in the, the Christian themes of the novel, death is a doorway to to paradise. Yeah. Right. So for Owen to die, this is not a tragedy. Right. I mean, it feels like a tragedy. Right. It always feels like a tragedy to those who who live beyond those who die. That that's has to be taken for granted. And believe me, I've I've been there. There is I I I have felt like stabbing someone in the throat who told me that something was part of God's plan. Right. There is nothing more infuriating than sure. that shit in in reality. The Lord moves in mysterious ways. Well, you know what the. The the Lord gave me blood cancer. The Lord gave a child blood cancer. Right. Fuck that, right? He never gives you more than you can handle. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. But so, so in the context of the book, the the text as a universe unto itself, I don't think we can uh, take death as a moral or immoral thing because the text of the universe is very much a Christian universe, mm-hmm. uh, wherein uh, we accept Christianity as as the we can accept Christianity as the ultimate truth. Sure. I disagree about faith, faith well, being. That's fine. I think that's good. And I think I think that's a good defense or explanation or whatever. But I also think something you said reminded me of like there's this saying that like one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is, is a statistic. I think that's, I think you're quoting Stalin. Am I? I think so, yeah. Very cool. Do we have a Joseph Stalin tier on our Patreon? This, we is, this is a uh, tanky podcast now. Owen dies, and it's a tragedy, especially because he dies in a hero. He, does a, he doesn't have to. Like, he knows how he's going to die. He could just not go to the airport that day, or he sees the kids, he could run the other way or whatever, if, if yeah. he believes whatever. Like, there's a ways that he could not die, because if, if you knew how you were going to die, he, like, he walks into it because he thinks that that's the purpose. And right? he dies with a smile on his face. He's yes. happy when he dies. What the book also does to that great Stalin quote, one of the things I think is very effective is the passage of time via New Year's Eves mm-hmm. with Hester vomiting in the Rose Garden or whatever, and Johnny talking about how many soldiers are in Vietnam and how many soldiers have, you know, run away from Vietnam and how many have been killed in Vietnam and whatever. And I think that's the thing. It's like we're losing hundreds of thousands of people over there, but they're just nameless. Like, Owen's the tragedy here because it's Owen's story. Right. Yeah, because we're following him. We've specifically microscoped on him. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, I think we have three more villains that I I can count. Three more villains? Yeah, uh, two of them are... So Barb Wiggins is a villain. Oh, yes. Right? Because she is... former airline stewardess, flight attendant, whatever they called her. Yeah, because she is also a bully. And she, uh, very similarly to Randy White, she feels undermined by Owen. So she attempts to embarrass him by giving him a hard-on. By kissing him on the mouth when he's 11. And she's a yeah. grown-ass woman. Yeah. So she wants to... Uh, he's, he's bound in a swaddling cloth. And he can't move, and she gives him a hard on so that he's embarrassed in front of everybody. But Owen doesn't really seem terribly embarrassed by that. I mean, he blushes a little bit, but also later on we find out that Owen has a was, huge dick. I was gonna say that. Yeah, Which, truly no reason to include the fact that Owen has a huge dick in this, or as they call it, a doink. A doink. Yeah. So Barb Wiggins is is a villain, and 
Barb Wiggins' villainy, villainy um, gives us one of the best Dan Needham moments, right? Because Dan comes in and stands up for yeah. not only Owen, but for uh, Harold, the kid drifting in the rafters. Yes, because she says that, because her husband is the other minister, yeah. right? Uh-huh. And she says, Owen's not welcome in our church until he comes and apologizes or whatever. And like basically the way she's saying it is like, even after he does that, he's not going to be welcome back. Johnny tells Dan this, and Dan says, who's going to talk about the kid that you left up in the rafters, who's still up in the rafters right now, by the way, who eventually comes back and is at the funeral. And I, I, I'm not I'm not sure that this is what the text is saying, but it is a culturally thematic thing. Who the fuck are you to decide a, a border for a church? Who, who, who yeah. are you to say who can come in and go out of God's house, well, right? That's what's fascinating about what you were saying before about a plus top tier christianity like owen walks the walk yeah and i think there is something and again maybe it's maybe it was always the way that we grew up but like as children of the 80s and 90s like what we think of school like i think of school probably as much meaner then and today than it was in the 50s when he was because this takes place i don't don't know if that's true or not but the point i'm getting to so that johnny and owen were basically born in 1942 ish uh, the mom dies in 53, and then they eventually go to be, like, it's, you know, Owen dies probably the mid-60s at some point, right? I just think about if someone, because Owen is physically, I don't want to say deformed, but physically unusual. Yeah. Thereby a target for bullying. And he's got a weird voice, thereby a target for bullying. And he's also, like, so supremely in tune with his faith to the point where, like, he he seems more... Not, not even just like religious, but knowledgeable about this. And even the minister, like it just feels yeah. like that's right for bullying. And yet I think because he is so pure that he, I don't want to say gets a pass, but people respect him more. And also he just becomes so pure of heart and like helps people that they all like. He's also like evidently incredibly charismatic. Yeah. Right. Like he, he commands, he steps into a room and, and partially because he stands out physically and because his voice is so unique, he becomes the center of attention. Yes. The spotlight's on him. He doesn't shy away from that spotlight. Well, again, it goes back to you shall know our philosophy. It's just like there's the narrator not really living a life, and there's the charismatic, charming best friend who is able to do anything in spite of whatever limitations life maybe throws at him or whatever. Right. Anyway. Uh, fourth fourth uh, uh, villain. Well, what I was going to say, and this is yeah, going to go lead ahead. into the fourth villain, is that I think in both Barb Wiggin and also in the mysteries of Johnny's mom somewhat, and also the couple that's at Gravesend Academy that's fucking in every room, which is pretty funny. They're great. I love that. Uh, I, yeah, I would do that, too. If I there is a I very remember. confusing, I think on purpose, because it is through the eyes of largely a teenager, a confusing and sort of frank look at sexuality in older women. Yeah, this is a theme. This is a theme with Irving. So I think that's fascinating. I think that leads into the fourth. I have. I have. I have a. um, Is the fourth villain? Well, Larry Lish and Larry Lish's mom, Mrs. Mitzi Lish. Mitzi Lish, yeah, because she is sexually bullying Owen or trying to. But at this point, Owen will no longer let himself be bullied. Right, and also, you know, tries to get him expelled or whatever for being an anti-Semite. And even Larry's just like, I don't, I don't know what she's talking about. That's just how she says it. Everybody, like Owen didn't say anything. But yeah, it's. I think there's a lot of these women. You know, they all to some extent or other probably live unfulfilling lives because it's the fifties and the sixties and. This country's still not great for women, and especially not back then. So they're all probably stunted in some way or other, or not, and they're all just acting out. I mean, even Johnny's mom is probably too sexual, maybe with Owen, but who knows? Because we have that—that's that's Johnny's interpretation right. of Owen's interpretation, and that's also filtered through sexually charged boys. Like, probably she was totally fine, right? It doesn't seem like she was... Definitely fine. Okay, well, so here's here's something that, it, uh, again, death of the author, etc. There's a New York Times article about John Irving that you can't read because it's behind a fucking paywall, but this is on his Wikipedia page, so I can't, you know... I can bring it up. You want me to my, bring it up? No, 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 it's okay. My, my, we can, you can read it later, and then uh, if I'm wrong, you can cut this out. Um, nope. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Thematically, in John Irving's books, past just Owen Meany, there's a lot of incest. Okay. And there is also a lot of relationships with significantly older women. Okay. Quote unquote relationships, right? We can interpret that as predation. Sure. John Irving was himself molested by a much older woman when he was 11 years old. Okay. So you can track that throughout his his books and and you see 
in this text, you see sort of predatory older women, right? And then you see through the nature of trauma, through the nature of her relationship with Owen and Owen having never developed, never having grown past looking like a little boy. Right. You have Hester, who later on is a rock star, goes by the name Hester the Molester. Right. And who also only has sex with virgin boys. Yeah. Uh, which is like, that's fucked, right? That's like a, that's fucked. Yeah. But I think that's also something like, I had a friend in college Uh-oh. who took more than a few girls' virginity, but that was like a thing for him. But I feel like the inverse... I don't want to talk about no, this. No, but I feel, I feel like the inverse is like empowering in a weird way. Like it's, an, it's again, a look at adult female sexuality. Well, I will, I, I, I will uh, fight you on the terms taking someone's virginity. Let's... The, the, Should I cut this whole thing out? I, <laughs> it's up to you. I think that that element of Hester yeah. is another look at an unusual or unique or frank take on adult female sexuality whether or not it's healthy or normal or whoever's to say the same way that these women are preying on manipulating or exhorting exuding whatever their power over johnny and owen in the 50s and the 60s whatever she's doing to unnamed unseen boys yeah. In the eighties. Yeah. And and Irving, um, to his to his credit, is a non judgmental author. Well, he's judgmental of like Ronald Reagan and shit. But like the characters in his in his own novel, he presents them with a sort of um eye toward forgiveness, I think. Yeah. Because even these villains get get forgiven over and over again. Um, which I think brings us to the the Actu- who I actually Well, think. do we want to talk about Mrs. Lish or not really? do you do you have more to say about it than that? No, just that you know, to a certain extent, like Owen becomes enamored by JFK, and there's a whole Marilyn Monroe subplot that maybe we'll talk about. Not subplot, but, like, thread, sort of, and comparing her, like, how she is America, right? Yeah. and Which is phenomenal. And Some of the best writing in the whole book. Which I copied and pasted the thing, and you're like, yeah, but I took a picture of that. I'm like, yeah, nailed it. Cool. (laughs) Uh, But the two of them, the son and the mom, kind of, like, screw Owen up by, like, saying, you know, JFK is having sex with Marilyn Monroe, and, like, it mars this idyllic figure then maybe he's like maybe catholics are bad because he like right like he doesn't outwardly say that but he like goes on a out on a ledge to a certain extent to like vouch like he runs like a voting like a pledge drive or whatever like get people to vote for jfk and then he finds out that this guy is like a philanderer and so well it shows you that they're you know he's a false idol sure there there are no heroes outside of christ i guess and owen and owen owen christ I mean, yeah, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad that you you brought it back to talk more about Lish, because um, that is an important theme to to think of. I did think of a thing. You know, like men are from Mars, women are from Venus, like that yeah. stump, that thing from the '90s or whatever. I was thinking men are from New York, women are from Los Angeles. Is that anything? No. I mean, what what would it be? What is it? I don't know because that's what the the Lish is, but like it's the inverse. Like Mrs. Lish is in New York and Mr. Lish is in Beverly. Hills. Men are from Ames, Iowa. Women are from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Makes sense to me. Farmers and, uh, I don't know. So who's the real say, villain? Say the misogynist thing you're about no, to say. Like, bikini, like beach beach babes. <laughs> okay. It wasn't terrible. It was just not smart. <laughs> All right. What was, who's the real villain? Who's the ultimate villain? Uh, the, the real villain is Merrill, the, uh, Johnny's father. Yeah. Reverend Merrill. And the reason why, which I had brought up on my phone, but now I have to scroll backwards because my phone went to lock screen. This is it a conversation with our friend Egg? Yeah. I, well, just, you know, I got my thoughts out in, in, the, in the conversation and then, it, and I only came to this in the, in the last pages toward, towards the end, because I guess that's when you would come to, well, come what's, to that. What's remarkable to me, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, is that's that okay. how much happens in the final pages? Because, For a book that moves so slowly. Yes, because yeah. another thing this book does structurally is it'll be like, and then there was Owen's funeral, and then like 75 pages later, we get to Owen's funeral. But like, it says a thing that's going to happen, and then like backtracks deftly. And, like, sets it up in a way. But the whole thing is, like, we know Owen dies because we've seen his funeral. And then Johnny's like, I guess I got to tell – something along the lines of, like, I guess I should tell you how Owen died. Or I'm never going to forget how Owen died or whatever. Yeah. And it happens in the last, like, four pages. Yeah. I also just structurally, this novel's a marvel. I, I, w- I would love to see an outline of it from a linear perspective of where the events happen chronologically versus where they happen in the text. Because we – bounce around all over the place with the with um him explaining what happens because obviously yeah. the funeral takes place before owen's death in the in the text um, right 
you know, even though chronologically, obviously, you know, et cetera. Because like largely it's, there's two timelines, right? There's like February, 1987 in Toronto, like over the span of like maybe a week or two. No, no, it's months. Is it months? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then there's from like 1950 or whatever through the death of 53 to Owen's death in like the 60s. And that's largely linear. But again, like you're saying, not 100% linear. But yeah. Mostly. So I have Merrill as the... Okay, so so here's why I'm Merrill's the villain, right? His lack of faith is derived from selfishness. Mm-hmm. He stands counterposed to Owen, whose faith is entirely selfless, right? He sacrifices his own life for his faith, right? So Owen's faithful despite his being an instrument of death and in spite of his calling to sacrifice himself, whereas Merrill is the opposite of that because his faith runs from him because he can't bear responsibility for the death that he wishes for. He's not a villain in the same way that uh, Randy White or Barb Wiggins or Dick are. They're monstrous and authoritarian or bullies or psychos or whatever. He's an antagonist because he's thematically opposed to the novel's goals. He's made pathetic for that, and, and I think ultimately we end up having sympathy for him because he does come back from that to become a man of strong faith. But he is tricked into his faith, yeah. right? He doesn't, he doesn't come about it honestly the way that, the way that Owen does. But more importantly, through all that, Owen has sim- Owen remains sympathetic towards him, which is Christ-like, even though Owen knows that he is a fraud. So Merrill can only think of reasons not to feel, not to feel things. And I think what Irving is asking us is he's asking us to feel instead of think. Because as Owen says over and over again throughout the book, faith is not about proving it. Like, there's nothing more infuriating to me than when... Christians like try to argue for the existence of God. They try to argue for it by proving things, by making arguments. And it's like, that's not the point. You're not going to be able to prove the existence of God. Even inside the context of Christianity, you can't prove the existence of God. And that's by design, right? Because because God wants you to take that leap of faith. He's not proving it to you. If God wanted to prove it to you, he could just come down and say, hey, I'm God. I did all of this. You'd be like, fuck right? off. He's, he's, he's asking you right. to believe, and only through belief without proof can you actually show that you're worthy of the kingdom of heaven, right? That's the whole fucking idea. Owen does in this thing, like, the best way that I've heard it done in real life, too, where he's, and it's very clear where it's going, or it was, it was clear to me, but he's explaining something to Johnny about something Johnny can't see. He's like, so you, even when it's not there, you believe that it's there? He's like, yeah, of course I do, or whatever. And he's like, that's what me and God, like, he does it in a way that, like, this isn't explaining it to you, Johnny, but this is what it feels like to me. Yeah. That's all you can do. It's like, this is why I believe whatever I believe, yeah. or this is how it makes me feel. And if you don't feel that way, cool. That's right. your thing. But, like, for me, it works like this. You can feel that exact same way about a different thing, and at least that gives you the context for how I feel about this other thing. Yeah. Um, so those are the villains. That's the second. That's the second of the of the three or four things that I had scheduled. Yeah. Um, this is going to be a long episode, I think, because it's a long book. You mentioned it. I sure did. Is Johnny in love with Owen? So that's another thing from the interview that I think. Okay. In the modern day, in the 1987 in Toronto, he is described multiple times as a non-practicing homosexual, which he doesn't identify. Other people describe him. Correct. As that. Yeah bachelors of a certain age who've never really had girlfriends and don't actively do anything they just assume that society they, they've decided to like live a life of celibacy because like it's quote unquote wrong or whatever to be gay and they don't want to be seen that way or whatever right and so it's just this whole like and john irving in the interview says that there were multiple men at the private boys academy that he went to growing up that were described that way it's just heartbreaking to think about people who like for whatever reason like just even that's not true yeah, just like whatever sure. terrible so in that interview, he was saying that he does believe that Johnny is in love with Owen, but that he leaves that he leaves that up to the reader, which he should. <laughs> he didn't want to just make it like textual. He wanted to like just sort of. So I was reading it not that he was in love with Owen, but that he was obsessed with Owen to a certain extent and like yeah. unable to live his life. Like I think there's that thought that like. His mom gets killed at 11 and just like, well, how am I supposed to live a normal life? Like we sort of talked about that with other books, I think, too, right? That we've we've covered this season. No, like you just kind of like it's terrible, but you kind of yeah. just keep going on. But I think he keeps finding reasons or excuses and just never really knows what he wants in life. Like he knows he doesn't want to go to Vietnam. 
nobody really wanted to go to Vietnam except for ones who were like Dick. Like I think I think he's just aimless and fascinated by Owen because Owen's a fascinating figure. Yeah, I, I think I think his his unconditional love for Owen goes so beyond what is uh, normal in the context of friendship. It would never occur to him to have it be romantic. Yeah. So I think I think uh, you know Owen has commandeered his life in a way that is probably unhealthy. Uh, the same way that Owen has commandeered Hester's life in a way that's unhealthy. It's also really fucked up that Owen's like, yeah, come meet me in Phoenix. And it's like, why? Basically, so you can watch me die. So you can help me die the way that I'm supposed to. Well, I think I think also that that's another um, remarkable aspect of the Christian nature of this book is how much of a hero Johnny is without any of the fanfare. Sure. Right? Johnny... You know, he does. He, he he does basically all the things that Owen does, except he doesn't die. I mean, he sacrifices, right? He, like, he gives up his life to essentially help Owen's story. Yeah, and his life is completely derailed. But he puts himself in the same dangerous circumstance. He uh, endlessly practices the shot over and over again, which is another— Which, sh- when the shot comes back, I was like, holy— No, when I, when I read that in—I uh, think 2013 was the first time that I read this book— I swear to God, I had to fucking lay down. <laughs> I was like—I I, I was like— this is too good. It's because it's the same thing with the finger. The finger chapter is like this too. This is another thing that I was talking with Meg about actually. Oh yeah. Which is, which is that like, like once it happens, like once the shot happens, you're like, there's no other way that the novel could have gone than that. But the fucking genius, the, 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 the the, like over the top, like Michelangelo esque fucking Da Vinci, whatever you want to call it, like genius of John Irving in this moment, is that like until the moment that the only thing that possibly could have happened happens, yep. you have no idea what the fuck is going to happen. Yep. Each of these chapters is like the blank, basically, right? Yeah. It's like a thing. It's the foul ball, the armadillo, the angel, the little Lord Jesus, the ghost of the future, the voice, the dream. The finger, the shot. But the finger and the shot are explicitly fucking named after the thing that you know is going to happen, and you don't know until the last minute. So the finger, so the audiobook chapter for the finger is like four hours long, and it's like three hours and 50 minutes, and I'm like, did I miss what the finger is? And then he goes to the granite quarry or whatever, goes to the the, the, the shop, and there's just the diamond cutter. It's like, of course it's that. Especially because it's like symbolically, so the, throughout the entire novel, right, um, you have hands, like hands keep coming, like um, you have hands being removed. Owen's hands are removed at the end. Johnny's fingers removed at the end. The Virgin Mary's hands the are Virgin removed. The Virgin Mary, uh, no, no, it's Mary Magdalene. Mary right? Magdalene, yeah. Um, uh, you have, uh, and, and those hands are reattached to uh, Johnny's mom's dummy, yeah. which is then used to spook Meryl, um, you have this reminder constantly that people in the quarry are, are losing fingers yep. all the time. So like over and over again, you're reminded of that and you know that he's going to get Johnny out of Vietnam somehow. And you know that he's been practicing on this diamond thing. It's really like almost maybe even the last paragraph of of that chapter where you're just like, like, holy shit, it happened. It, yeah. it, and, and you don't know... It's going to happen until it does. Because, and we were talking about this before, that the the funny part about the interview with John Irving was that he said that a lot of book reviewers outed themselves because they described Owen as a boy who died in Vietnam, and they described Johnny as a Vietnam deserter. Like, he just uh, yeah, he defected right, to right, Canada. Right, yeah. And neither of those happen. Right. Owen dies in a bathroom in Phoenix, and Johnny, I mean, dodges vietnam in, in a different way but like he doesn't go to can he because we see him in canada we know from the like the very first chapter right he's talking in the modern day that he's in canada You're like oh he, he chooses to go to canada because america killed owen meany right but you think the entire time that's right he yeah. goes there because he didn't want to go to vietnam so if you're a book reviewer that just read the first 300 pages and then bailed on it and yeah. thought like i gotta I just file a, a 200 word review you're just gonna you know which is very funny because if the shot is not utilized in that way at the end of the novel, we have spent probably 60 pages of the entire book yeah. talking about this fucking useless basketball thing I was that has say, no other thematic relevance That's to the, the other book. thing. He loses the finger in a way to, like, propel the narrative in a way that, like, wasn't how you expected it to go, but was the only way that it could go, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the shot, yeah, it's like, it's basically like an alley-oop, kind of, but Johnny is getting the ball, basketball, passing it back to Owen, and then, like, lifting Owen up. And letting him dunk. Basically, that's is that the shot? That's the shot, yeah. 
And the entire time he's like, we need to do it faster. We need to do it faster. And it's like, well, it, no. And then they get to a point and then Johnny's like, we can do it faster. He's like, no, 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 this is good enough. We, yeah, yeah, I think he says like, don't be silly. <laughs> yeah, we, can, we just, it's more important to be consistent. It's like, what are you talking about? So they're doing this whole shot and they have this janitor and he's doing like the clock and like whatever. And he's just doing this whole thing. And then at the end, when there is the shot, because Johnny goes to this bathroom, he's just like, this is a weird ass bathroom. But like you have the entire layout of the bathroom. It's like, very, very, like if, if I didn't, again, like I knew what was coming when I was reading this time. But I don't know that I called it out when I when I read it. Well, because the, so the okay, so earlier in the in the narrative, they go to Boston to hopefully find Johnny's father, and they go to the voice coach. Owen calls this guy. He's like, with a voice like that, I'll talk to you anytime. Like you got a weird yeah. voice, kid. So they go, and it's again in painstaking detail of this guy's house. But that's not really to a payoff. I almost wonder if that's there as like, uh, yeah, sure. a, like a like a red herring. Like so when you get to the bathroom, he's like, "No, I do this. I do this all the time. <laughs> no, <laughs> nothing to see here, folks. I'm not describing this bathroom in painstaking detail because of any reason, really. No, but like I did have that thought. I'm like, there's a lot of detail in this weird ass bathroom with like a plywood stall in the middle. Blank. I'm like, all right, whatever. Like it's just a thing he does sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very specifically like this window is ten feet off the ground. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Basketball height. Yeah. It's almost like we could practice the shot in this room. Yeah, yeah, it would have been funny if he said that. So then, you know, in this thing, and he says, the shot, Johnny, or whatever he says at the end, I'm like, and I said out loud to no one, to the audiobook reader, no. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like I said, the the first time that I, the first time that I read this, I I put the book down, I went, I laid down. I just laid down on my bed, because I was just like, holy shit. Because I can see people, like this has, so I've, I've, I've asked you before about other books, I'm like, why is this book that you love and that I love, and this doesn't feel like a niche thing that only we would love? Why does this have like a three three on Goodreads? Oh, this is a, this is a mixed. A lot of people don't like this. But book the average all. of this is like a four two or something. It's a very high. Good. Well, you said that a lot of people who like don't like it or bail or whatever be like two stars couldn't finish or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And it's just like, well, that's a shit. Like, don't review things that you didn't right, finish, yeah. right? But anyway, I can see people getting to like. I mean, it's very far into the thing, but like the sixty pages of them just like. Playing basketball, and be like, <laughs> what the fuck is this book doing? Well, it's, it's sixty pages. Like, I know, I know, but still, throughout. but there's, but there's probably like a ten or fifteen page chunk where it's just like them doing that. Yeah, yeah. And there are certain points in the book where I'm like, if you're not invested, like, oh, this is a point where you check out because like it's so slow, but yeah. you don't, you don't get the payoff. You have to trust, right? Like, there is an author like Irving. First of all, I'm in on this book by the end of the first chapter. I'm all in. I'm I'm not, you know, the 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 foul ball is enough for me to to be like I'm committed to this ride wherever it takes me. And and when you're in such sure hands as that, yeah. You have to just believe. You ha- you have to say like this is going to pay off. I'm in a very Owen Mania-esque way. Faith takes practice. Right? <laughs> you you have to you have to um you just have to trust. So I knew that the shot was going to pay off. I had no idea how it was going to. And also the Irving's deep, deep skill, that's almost like a magic trick, is that when the shot is not front and center in the book, it is not in your brain. You don't right. you're not thinking of it. Even when a chapter is fucking called the shot. Yep. So when it happens, you're just like Well, because okay, so here's the other thing. When the chapter's called the shot, I had forgotten they call it the shot. And yeah, I'm yeah. thinking bullet. Uh-huh. Like that Owen is going to get like sniped or something. Because yeah, yeah. like when they present Dick, they present him in a way that like, it's like, oh, this guy might kill Owen. It's like carrying a fucking machete at the airport, right? Yeah. And like, he's like a known threat. Like it's one of those guys where it's like, well, we never like, we never knew that he was a new, it's like people called cops on this guy all the time. Like, how'd you not yeah. know he was going to shoot up a place or whatever? Like you, like you have him, whatever. Anyway, that's almost, it's almost surprising that he actually is the murderer because it feels like it only it can only be him, but maybe that's the same point. I don't know. But anyway, I think the shot is like him going to shoot Owen as opposed to the thing they've called the shot hundreds of <laughs> yeah, times right. in this book. Yeah, yeah. That they've practiced. That when they're in Arizona, they like try to find a, a basketball Which court to then practice it. even earlier, like hundreds of pages earlier set up by like, Owen's so light we pick him up all the time. Right, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it's fucking clockwork. It's clockwork. I, I tried really hard to find out how long it took Irving to write this book, and I, I couldn't I couldn't find it. Did you know that Dolly Parton wrote Jolene? <laughs> and I will always love you in the same, same night. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course everybody knows that. God, Come on, Tom. God God bless her. What else is there to to I I, I had a thought that I, I don't know that there's all that much depth to this thought, but um Johnny uh reminded me a lot of Nick Carraway from The Great Gatsby, and that he is largely a narrator that is uh 
he's very passive. The events yeah. happen to Johnny, and he is describing the life of a much more interesting man. And that man, the person that man's in love with, which is the narrator's cousin. And also there is uh, certain things about Gatsby that I hadn't really thought about this, but this is again from my conversation with Meg. She mentioned that um, there are probably millions of papers about how Gatsby's queer coded to to like the relationship between Nick and Gatsby, the same way that I'm sure people have written papers about uh, Owen Meany and the uh, the way that Johnny and Owen are queer coded. We well, talks about in a little bit in the interview, like influences on this. And there's like the, does he say Gatsby? No, he says the tin cup. Yeah. The, and he says something where a guy's initials no, are O M. Not the tin, the tin drum. Tin, tin drum. drum. Yeah, tin sorry. Drum. Yeah. Tin drum. The Gunther Grass novel. And then something where characters name where our, our initials are O M. And it's like some like maybe Russian sounding name. I don't know. Mazarov, Mazarov or something. I don't okay. know. What he doesn't mention are the now you've now brought up two different books or two different authors at least that they reference fairly at length in this because also by the way another reason that you would probably love this book is because Johnny is an English teacher sure. and there are like prolonged ish not as long as other things but like discussions about novels and there's a long discussion about the Great Gatsby which talks about the narrator and whether you can believe a narrator and whether they're like trustworthy people or good people or whatever. And then I think they also talk about Dostoevsky, who you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And, like, there's just all these different things. And, like, that's one thing I felt, like, a little out of touch on. Like, I don't have the... Like, I read Gatsby in high school, but not since. So, like, I know the story. I saw that Leonardo DiCaprio movie. (laughs) Um, But, like, I felt like there's so much... Like, another thing that, like, intersections of things that either you're passionate about or that your life, like, it's the anti-war stuff and it's the English professor and it's faith and it's belief. It's just, like, oh, this all comes together in a way... That, but it's also smart that he's doing it to like, hey, think about this conversation we're having about this other book. It's also about this, too. Yeah. And also, I think that's also why this would not work as a movie, because your narrator is completely passive. I don't know how you make that character anything but a wallflower. He's just witnessing events. He's not really taking part in them until you have the the end. Yeah. Johnny's an incel. We talk about incels on this show a lot. Should we talk about the plays or not really? Like the Scrooge, the Christmas Carol, and Nativity or no? Owen just kind of backs his way into being the most important person in both of those, which is... Sure, yeah. But again, the only way that he could be. I like that they kept calling him the uh, the cowardly mailman. <laughs> like really Even funny. like hundreds of pages yeah. later, oh, the cowardly mailman's here. <laughs> Man, you got fucking dinged with the nickname cowardly 40 years ago. <laughs> Um, oh, the mom at, at Tabby's funeral, like kids playing baseball outside. Like, can you, oh, ima- can that's, you imagine? Yeah, no, that's, that's heartbreaking. That was so, that, and that's so expertly done because everyone in the, in the church starts covering their ears because yeah. they're all horrified by it and you don't really know what it is until, until they mention it. And then he's got, he's got baseball as a trigger for him for the rest of his life, right? Yep. Which is like, um probably a hard thing to have as a trigger because it's sort of ubiquitous in america well it makes sense he moved to canada because it's like they don't give a shit <laughs> get away yeah uh there's another thing uh, uh, that we, not although a- the blue jays are in the world series in in, in 1987 right that's part of the, the, the that's part of the book is it 87 no it's like it no it's not it's a couple years after that i think oh it is okay so like, i think it's like they won like 90 and 91 or 91 92 but they're good they're getting i think maybe okay. they're in the world Series. i don't know uh, yeah he talks about them being like uh, there's there's a brief part about that you're a big Blue Jays fan. We could, we could, I am a Blue Jays fan, actually. Uh, Fuck you. <laughs> Trying to pick a fight with me over the Blue Jays. Another thing that's not necessarily imperatively significant, but also talks about the exquisite plotting. That's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> Fuck, that sentence is terrible. No, I love it. Keep it in. Don't, absolutely don't take that sentence out. The exquisite plotting, but, indubitably. Wait, what's exquisite corpse? What is that? That's a thing. Yeah, I don't know. Let's just stay on track here. A game in which each participant takes turns writing or drawing on a sheet of paper, folding it to conceal his or her contribution to passing. Oh, it's just like the storytelling, where you tell a story bit by bit, but you don't know what the person said before, and it's like the whole whatever. Anyway, the exquisite plotting of when Owen kills the neighbor's dog, Saranac, or whatever? Sagamore. Sagamore. Almost in the same way that he killed the mom. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Like, through an unexpected athletic feat that, Uh like, a series of events had to happen. Like, the neighbor's who complain about too much noise, had to have the baby and had to have the diaper delivery and the truck coming at the right time and, like, everything had to be timed up perfectly. And it's just kind of like a microcosm of, like, the grander narrative. But again, Owen 
unintentionally killing someone. Well, the, the, also the reality is that that's every single thing, right? We only tend to think about that in real life during moments of extraordinary trauma, right? It's like, well, if if my brother hadn't uh, had gone to the store earlier in the day, my mom wouldn't have gone to the store, and if she if she didn't go to the store, she wouldn't have run into this guy who was drunk and blah blah blah. And it's like, but the reality is also like. Well, if he didn't go to the store, then my mother wouldn't have picked up eggs and I wouldn't have had an egg sandwich, right? So, but, like, we only apply weight right. to to the things. And it's like that's – when Owen says there's no such thing as coincidence, that, like, 100% is, like, a deterministic view because, like, coincidence is only, like, your stupid human brain connecting dots that you find relevant. Right. Everything is interconnected, and you can connect. You, you can you can like m- create any narrative that you want. It's like people who are like, uh, I was just thinking about him, and then he called me out of the blue. I must be a little psychic. And it's like, how many fucking times do you think about him, and he doesn't call you? Right. Is, is like, is that relevant? Right. Of course, it was going to happen eventually. Yeah. I wrote down something we talked about. Dan defending Owen and Director Barb is the book's best showing yet, which I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> What are you, a theater reviewer? Yeah, maybe. Erections. Barb kissing Owen. Johnny wanting to take advantage of Jermaine. Should we talk about Jermaine? Not really. That's well, she, she's a development in Johnny's sexuality before Johnny's sexuality is snuffed out by Owen's death. Yeah. And by his consistent rejection. But almost it almost feels like, oh, my friend Owen got an erection. I should get an erection, too. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. The one thing I texted you about that I would love to see is just uh, a mini series of Owen and Grandma watching tv and just shitting on it because there's like, no, a, no, shit- that, like a podcast oh and yeah. grandma having a having an old tv podcast because they talk about how they hate everything um even though as we know the shit that you hate don't make you special but they're just shitting on everything and there's like there's the one thing that they both loved and it's liberace <laughs> <laughs> yeah well uh, so, so that that's something that's actually interesting too is the lack of commentary on uh, the AIDS epidemic and the lack of commentary on gay content in general, except for Owen to Owen and the grandmother to sort of cheer Liberace along when he says that he's not gay. So that's actually another thing. I didn't remember. I didn't realize that I learned so much from this interview, but that's another thing that John Irving brings up. He says that he did a Vietnam, his Vietnam book is 20 years after Vietnam, the same way that he set Cider House rules so much earlier because he didn't want to have it weighed down by, like, the modern consensus or whatever. So I feel like he's not commenting on the gay culture and the AIDS epidemic because that's happening then. Yeah, that makes sense. So if he did a book, like, in 2005, maybe, like, it would be about that, right? But, like, he wants to consciously give himself distance and Mm -hmm. time to process Maybe it is weird that he doesn't comment on it or that they're just like, yeah, he's not gay or whatever. Well, and also, I mean, it, I think it might lend some credence to this idea that remember, uh, 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 remember that thing that I didn't say in the Pizza Girl episode that my therapist said to me, which was ignoring something is the most thought that you can give it. Yep. So uh, the, the, the curious absence of gay content uh, queer codes the book a little bit, too. Sure. We mentioned it briefly, but I think the funniest one of the funniest things I've read in a while is the moving the shrinks of VW. It's just it's so funny. Yeah. How bumbling. Like it becomes like a comedy for like a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's slapstick. Which is slapstick is hard to do in, in, in writing. I mean that's very much like physical physical comedy is, is visual. Yeah. So it's uh, to to be able to pull that off in, in writing a sort of technical marvel. And maybe is there anything to talk about with uh off Mrs. Meany dying in the fire for being draped in the American flag? <laughs> that's maybe a little over the top. <laughs> Yeah. The other thing that I thought was kind of over the top, because, again, because it takes it out of the reader's hands. This is my, my sole criticism of the book as, as far as something that I think could be changed within it. Owen possessing Meryl briefly to have him speak in Owen's voice and Owen rescuing Johnny from falling. He's down a ghost. He's a ghost for about 15 pages. Yeah, I don't I, I think that's a, a that is a bridge too far for me. I um, am already there on faith. I think. Uh, Irving is, in this case, doing what Owen has argued against so much, which is that you don't need to prove it. Yeah. Stop trying to prove it. You can, we, we, we've gone with you this far on faith. Let us just take it on faith that, that it was God's plan. Well, so I think you could, I think they're both presented to be literal, right? Yeah. That, but I think that they can both be taken metaphorically, where, mm-hmm. like, Johnny is, like, stumbling around drunk and almost falling down, and, like, 
just having a moment where he catches his balance or whatever. Like he's like grasping for something that like finds the light switch and reorients him, right? Like it doesn't have to be Owen taking it, ghost Owen taking his hand and putting on the light switch and then pushing his back forward. Even though that's how it's described, yeah. it can be just kind of like a lucid, like a moment of clarity. Right, it is subjective first-person experience yes. of an intoxicated person who's been traumatized. And then there's also, like, he possesses Mr. Merrill to shout in Owen's voice, but that just might be guilt. That's, yeah, I don't know. That might be a stretch, but again, is that more of a stretch than he's a ghost possessing a man? Because there's not really fantastical elements unless you count, like, religion or or fate or determinism as fantastical. Like, there's nothing else even remotely to that. So, like, is it a stra- – I don't know. I don't know. But I agree. It's, it's yeah, weird. Yeah, it, it just – I think it pushes it a little bit too far for me. Like, I, don't, I wouldn't want the book to become this, but, like, if Owen was just, like, ghost Owen for the rest of the book, like, it's like, okay, at least at least <laughs> it's, like, a thing, right? Yeah, yeah. But just to have these two moments or whatever, it's, it's strange. But let's talk about – while we're talking about faith, let's talk about the titular prayer for Owen Meany, which is not really quite a prayer at all. Yeah, so it happens after Owen gets kicked out of Gravesend Academy, right? Yeah, for counterfeiting draft cards, and, yeah. And it's led by Reverend Merrill in a act of defiance against the current headmaster. Randy White. Merrill, in leading this prayer, it's a silent prayer. Yeah. It's, it's gone completely, uh, completely quiet, and it goes on for a long time. And this is after the new valedictorian... Because Owen was the only kid in the class who had a perfect GPA, and he was going to be the valedictorian, and he was, like, working on the speech. And the valedictor- valedict- the new one comes up, and he's just like, yeah, Owen's out of his class. I got nothing to say. Yeah, he's the voice. Yeah. But the, a, thing, a thing that we learn later on, uh, which we couldn't know at the time, is that uh, Reverend Merrill has no faith. So Because the, he lost it. He had it at one point, but he lost the, it. The, the reason that he's not saying a prayer for Owen Meany, the reason why he's not leading the congregation in prayer— is because he's a non-believer. He doesn't believe. So his prayer for own meaning is is absent. There is no prayer, right? Which is, um, I mean, we can talk about faith through actions as far as, as a Catholic doctrine and how, like, Owen's the embodiment of that. Um, Merrill, as far as faith through action is concerned, is n- not. I mean, Merrill's not Catholic, so I don't, I don't know. But there is another prayer for Owen Meany. Mm-hmm. Which is what Johnny's prayer is, because Johnny, when Owen dies, he goes to Johnny's, or he goes to Owen's bedroom. Johnny goes to Owen's bedroom when Owen dies, and he talks to Owen's dad, and he's looking for the baseball, because he, at the scene of the crime, quote-unquote crime, at the accident, when his mom died, the baseball went missing. And the police chief's like, we need this, it's the instrument of death. And he's like, idiot, like, just stop. It's not a murder. Right. Small town cop, probably the only action in town that month or whatever, right? Like, it's a thing. So Johnny's like tearing, not tearing Owen's room apart, but like looking ever. He's like, he has, like, there's no other person who would ever have the baseball. It has to be Owen. Um, and it's not Owen. And his dad's like, are you looking for the baseball? Because I've looked many times and I can't find it. But what he does take is a couple books. He takes Owen's diary, which we eventually, you know, we hear Owen reading. But it's only because Johnny knows after the fact, right? But he also takes a prayer book. And that's kind of what like leads him down this path of faith but then he has i guess through that and just through his own personal faith or whatever his own prayer for own meaning which is how it ends would you just give him back yeah which is so sad yeah i think it's the last words of the book right give him back yeah and i'm gonna keep saying it give him back it's like oh god yeah no it's this is harrowing yeah especially because johnny has faith and he knows that it's the right thing and he knows those children are alive because of owen and he knows that um owen did what he wanted to he you know uh whether or not want was a factor right he um he was god's instrument and johnny believes that but johnny in the the selfish way of the living want the dead to return to them yeah heartbreaking yeah the other um the other thing that, that that is along these lines, well, this is out of context from almost everything that we're talking about, but I remember texting it to you because I found it incredibly moving, was when they're talking about the shot, Owen says, we just need a little faith. And Johnny says, we need to practice. Yep. And Owen returns by saying, well, faith takes practice, right? It's so simple, right? Like, it's such a simple thought, but that's what it is. It's just, they're both kind of right. Owen's, yeah. just, Owen's just more right. <laughs> There's also the passage, and I think it's the only thing that I want to talk about, Comparing Marilyn Monroe to America. She's not old. She's not young. She's breathless, beautiful, maybe a little stupid, maybe a lot smarter than she seemed, funny and sexy and vulnerable, never quite happy, always a little overweight, just like our whole country. It's just like, holy shit. Like, it's just, I don't know if there's a thing that, like, people consciously had a thought of at the time, or if that's just John Irving being like, 
I can craft something out of this. Well, I mean, more importantly, the part after that where he says, uh, and powerful men just think that they're there for a thrill. Yes. For, for, they think and she's there men, for a thrill. Those famous powerful men, did they really love her? Did they take care of her? If she was ever with the Kennedys, they couldn't have loved her. They were just using her and they were being careless and treating themselves to a thrill. That's what men, powerful men do to this country. It's a beautiful, sexy, and breathless country. Powerful men use it to treat themselves to a thrill. They say they love it, but they don't mean it. They say things to make themselves appear good. They make themselves appear moral. That's what I thought Kennedy was, a moralist. He was just giving us a snow job. He was just being a good seducer. I thought he was a savior. I thought he wanted to do, use his power to do good. People say and do anything just to get the power. They only use the power to just get a thrill. Meryl Monroe was always looking for the best man. Maybe she wanted the man with the most integrity. Maybe she wanted the man with the most ability to do good. And she was seduced over and over again. She got fooled. She was tricked. She got used. She was used up. She was like the country. The country wants a savior. The country is a sucker for powerful men who look good. We think they're moralists, and then they just use us. That's what's going to happen to you and me, said Owen Meany. We're going to be used. Fucking over and over again. And you think about it, reading over it from 1987, again. it's just like, oh, that happened. Nothing has changed. Nope. Nothing has changed. But uh, and, and it's interesting. There's a duality. And maybe this can be one of the – maybe we can move on to emails after, after this. There is a duality to that. Like, we're going to be used. And, and, and in that sense – in, in like the syntax of the, of that sentence is very careful because it implies a, 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 a negative, right? But also within the context of Owen's Christianity being used to be of use rather than to be used, right? It's such a, it's such like a slight difference, but to be of use is the uh, pinnacle. It's, it's like the most valuable thing that you could do for yourself, for the world, for faith, Here for I am God. Lord, it is I, Lord. Yeah, just that. Yes. Yeah. Or to, um, uh, you know, the Bill Callahan song, smog, the smog song to be of use, right? It's a beautiful, beautiful song. Should that be the closing music on this episode? The first line of it is, um, most of my fantasies are, are of making someone else come. So no. <laughs> um, but it's it's it like starts out crudely. I mean, if you believe that sexuality is crude, like to, to like express a beautiful sentiment, right? The most valuable thing that you could be is useful. Sure. Like it's a, it's a very utilitarian. It's very Marxist, um, while at the same time being very Christian. Yeah, but being used is completely like your different. Object. Completely different. It takes thing. away agency. It takes away. Yeah. Everything. Yeah, it's such like a, a slight syntactical difference, but it's the world. It means everything. Yeah. And by all accounts, like Marilyn Monroe had like a miserable life, but we all loved her. Yeah, she's a great actress. So Meg, our friend Egg, your friend Egg, our friend Egg, hey yeah. Egg, future podcast co-host when I get fired from this <laughs> podcast for not having smart things to say. Uh, she's she, great. She should have been on this. Uh, she should have been on this episode. She lives in Boston, though, so. Well, I was just there. I could have picked her up. Not really. She there. lives in Somerville, Boston. Not Boston. She lives in Somerville. Like, so you, it's like... A, We're twins. You guys have a twin city thing going on here. Yeah. Meg's reaction to A Prayer for Owen Meany. A Prayer for Owen Meany is easily one of the best books I've ever read. Okay. Brag. <laughs> what is that? It's not a brag. The book was sad but not cruel. I cried during the mom's funeral and I teared up when Johnny lifted Owen to grab the grenade, but the book didn't feel like it was trying to force me to feel sad. It was just the telling a story that had sad parts. I like that there were twists that didn't feel like they were there to trick you. Irving laid a ton of foreshadowing. That's yes. right, yeah. But it didn't really feel like foreshadowing until afterwards. Again, what we talked about, the only thing that could happen is the it just down that path, right? When you just had to bask in the glow of his genius. The moment that comes to mind the easiest is when Owen cuts off Johnny's finger. I audibly gasped once I realized what was happening with the saw, but up to that point in the novel, I just assumed that Owen had gotten him into Canada, even with Johnny saying that he didn't, quote, need Canada. Yeah, there we go. She sends an addendum, which I'm going to read first. I don't know if I can read it either way, but she says, While reading, I pictured Brick from the middle, Attica Schaefer as Owen Meany, Angela Lansbury as grandmother, and Ruth Wilson as mother. I could also see Patrick Wilson as Dan, but I didn't picture anyone specific while I was reading it. Well, Dan's a ginger. Dan's, like, very specifically, like, kind of a uh, someone that you would not recognize as being handsome. That's why it's so remarkable that the mother is interested in him. So Patrick Wilson is out. Too handsome. Yeah. You got to go with, like... The adult version of the kid from the Sandlot or something. Are you gonna fart right now? No, I'm just. I'm Joey gonna... lifted his one butt cheek up like he was gonna like just let I one. I was rip. sliding my leg. That's getting cut out too. <laughs> no, don't get, get, keep it in, man. We all fart. Before I end my email, which is why I rearranged it. Before I end my email, I could seriously write a million pages about why Owen Meany is so great. I just want to give a shout out to Dan Needham for being one of the best dads in literature. Interesting to note that my two favorite Dan moments. When he's being a dad for Owen and not Johnny. When he lays into Barb, which we talked about, after Johnny tells Dan that she sexually assaulted Owen, 
when she lays into when he lays into Ralph White about expelling Owen. Those two moments were some of the most satisfying. Yeah, that is great. We didn't talk about that, did we? The 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 white thing. No, we'll get the one more sentence. Let me just see what this says. Yeah. Those two moments were some of the most satisfying to me. They felt like the kind of speeches you make in your head after the fact when it no longer matters. E.g., the jerk store called. <laughs> I don't Thank know what that's like, from. What is the, the jerk store thing from? Well, I think it's just like a dumb retort. I, I, that, I, yeah, I've heard I've heard people say that before, but I've always assumed it was like from a Will Ferrell movie or something. I don't I don't know. If you want to email lottery at cageclub.me, join Egg. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about uh, Dan sticking up for Owen, because I do feel like, I don't know that Randy White is necessarily positioned as villainous objectively. I think subjectively because he kicks Owen out and because he is so determined to make his life miserable to go above and beyond because johnny even says confiscating everyone's wallets and shit like that that's real like it gets worse as time goes on yeah i think owen knows what because like the first interaction he has with owen was just like why am i talking to this guy he's not a, he's not a teacher he's not a Which I, like i'm kind, kind of with him on that <laughs> it's it's weird for a student to demand true again that's audience. even that's, that's even the point right like because it to owen it's just like well, this guy doesn't respect me but to like everybody else is like yeah, this kid's like sixteen. Like, what, are, what am I? I'm not gonna have a sit down meeting with him, right? Maybe, so, like, maybe we should respect sixteen year olds, though. But I do like that. He, yeah, he gets his come up and set like it's partially I think because he's wrong, but mostly because everyone loves Owen so much. Yeah, that they choose Owen over Randy, mm-hmm. including Dan. And and like I like Dan. He's like he's a good example of of like small town brave, which is like. You know that your actions are going to be known by everyone, mm-hmm. so you have to make your decisions, I guess, based on based on that. And and so, like, I think it's harder to be brave in circumstances where you know everyone is going to know about what you did. Maybe not. Maybe it's easier to be brave in those circumstances. I, don't know. I think it depends on the personality. Yeah, but Dan is like a he's a he's a moral rock throughout. Yeah, the first thing we I think the first thing we see Dan do is he shows up to the house when he meets the family and he says, Oh, you must be Johnny. And like Johnny makes a note that like, he didn't talk to him like a kid. He just talked to him like, and he didn't talk to him like an adult. Just like how he should talk to him. He's like, here's a gift. Don't touch, don't do anything with it. But like knowing he's going to open it up or whatever, and then get terrified from the armadillo. But like, it's just like, he handles everything. Like he knows he's been there before, even though he hasn't been, I don't think it's just like, he just knows what to do. Yeah. Love that Dan. Our smash hit subject topic segment Judge a book by its cover with the Honorable Judge Matt Erdley is taking a week off this week because he is on vacation with his family, so we're not going to call him on vacation. Yeah, we didn't consult with him. He'd probably be okay with it, but we don't want to bother him. Fantasy casting. I I actually think that we should we save this for the Yeah. Because we're gonna watch we're gonna we're gonna watch Simon Birch. You gotta pay for our Patreon, patreon.com slash lottery pod. Yeah. Five bucks gets you in the door. I think a thousand gets you Bob to beat up your dad or something. I will fuck your dad up for ten thousand dollars. There's a sliding scale depending on how much you want to pay. Patreon.com slash lottery pod. We'll talk about the casting there because I feel like it's going to be like, not this. Like, whatever we're seeing, not this. I have a very specific idea, but I also am, I, like, I think adapting this into, it's such a novel. Yeah. That adapting it into any other media would, like, it is an essentialist novel. It is a, se- it's, it's not a, like, it's not just a story. It is essentially a novel. Yeah, it doesn't like part of the be- the the reason why the voice works is because it doesn't exist. Right, like that's my problem. You played a little from the audiobook, like, and I didn't like it because like that's not the voice, and it's not how it's described either. Yeah, I think it's a crime. It would be a crime for this to be adapted into anything. Yeah, because I think you can hit like beats, like you can have like I've seen pictures of Owen Meany at a baseball game, like with the baseball bat in his hands. So, like you can have a kid foul off a pitch. And kill someone, but like, again, it's the whole like, how do you take six hundred and fifty something pages that are explicitly structured in a very specific way and turn it into a two hour thing? You probably don't. I do want to say that in addition to you having to lie down from the shot, it's also the thing where Owen's saying out loud, "Now I know why my voice never changed." Oh yeah, because it's like, oh shit, like him learning two like very simple phrases that he uses both of, I think, mm-hmm. but just telling his kids who are just in this weird-ass bathroom, be calm, don't worry, lie down. Yeah, and he has specifically, like, a a voice that would bring their attention directly to him and listen to him. And that they trust him because he looks and sort of sounds like them, in a yeah. way. Yeah, he has. Childish yeah. in both ways. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh my god. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. So would you recommend the book? 
uh, I mean, I yeah, I would re- I would recommend the book to serious to a serious reader. Yeah, uh, I, w- I wouldn't recommend it to someone who's going to fuck around. I don't know if this is my favorite this season or not. I think. Wow. Well, so I think it's by far the best book we've done. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that it's like favorite. Like I just think about favorite in terms of rereading, and like it just it would be a it's, it's a daunting reread. Yeah. Difficult, but I also don't know that I'd be like, "Hey, you know what I liked more than this? Pizza Girl." Even though like, Pizza Girl's great, it's just like I it feels weird to compare. Yeah, no, the two. no hate to to Jean Kyung Frazier. I mean, I've liked all the books. I think that both the last one and this one, Memories of My Father and this book, are both very difficult in different ways. Uh, this is far more rewarding. Right, I agree. I feel guilty that I gave both of them five stars on Letterboxd. Oh, well, that's only reads. fine. But this star system is inherently flawed. It's also the same kind of thing where it's just like. Just because they give Rad five stars doesn't mean that, like, it's as good as The Godfather, even though it is. But it's because, like, what it's trying to do, it does. And Memories of My Father is deconstructing television in a way that this is like, hey, let me exquisitely place this one grain of sand right here that you're going to forget about, but that sand's going to mean a lot later. Tali Shire in both Rad and The Godfather, by the way. On purpose. Oh, okay. No, it wasn't on purpose. (laughs) But, yeah. Any other thoughts about Owen Meany? Give him back. I'm gonna cry. We have an email address lottery at cageclub.me or lottery pod at cageclub.me. They both get here. Twitter at lottery pod, patreon.com slash lottery pod, cageclub.me slash lottery. Holy shit. For the um, audible button, which I did. It's so easy to use and you can cancel immediately. You get the two credits. They're not listening to this. Yeah, just steal whatever you can from. Steal and keep reading. Yeah. Um. Today's crime is. Uh, Wait. Did you say you said yeah? As in keep reading. You agree with keep reading? Oh no. I mean yeah. Yeah. As in let's move on past that as quickly as possible so that we can get to the real content of today, which today's crime is reckless driving. Most of my fantasies. Are of 